everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to your Just Not My Type state. Uh, as you can probably tell by the title slide, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about Rust here, uh, but don't worry. The general ideas that we're going to talk about around type states are applicable to most languages and frameworks uh, uh, that you're familiar with. And if you haven't used Rust or worked with Rust or even seen it, we'll gently introduce some of the ideas uh, in it so you can still follow along and maybe get your curiosity going. Uh, as a warning, though, we will be showing some code samples, though it'll be uh, Python and Rust. Uh, and if I'm showing Rust, I'll usually have Python as well to try to remain accessible. Uh, and we'll be looking at flow diagrams a bit. So if your, your Python and Rust are both rusty, uh, we, it should be relatively accessible. But I'm sorry, this is like the worst after lunch talk to have. So if you fall asleep, I get it. It's pr lunch was probably pretty good. All right, so who am I? Uh, I've been a professional in the security industry since 2017 and the broader software industry since uh, 2014, 2015. I began working professionally uh, as an Android developer for a relatively large company in Northeast Ohio uh, where we built uh, Android applications for like medical uh, and general business like documentation. Uh, after some exposure to security concepts through a Security Week event, so security champion programs work, I'm one of them, uh, that at that previous employer I got interested in the field and spent uh, a couple of years on my own time just kind of learning about security, kind of getting involved in communities, attending the local B-sides. Um, and I got really, really lucky somewhere along the way. I actually got to start my career uh, on the product security team at Dropbox. Uh, there I ran the bug bounty program, found vulnerabilities internally, fixed issues, uh, performed security reviews for products and features, all that fun stuff that you expect of your AppSec engineers. While I was there, I learned about bug bounties for the first time, and I became pretty obsessed. Met a bunch of cool people, uh, some of them here today, really kind of got me into uh, security even more so. Uh, after about netting about like 50 grand just from findings from a lot of private programs, live hacking events, I started to became, become a little disillusioned with bug bounties. So while I believe bug bounties are like a really important part of like a complete SDLC, I didn't feel like I was meaningfully improving security of these organizations. One of the depressing things that you kind of find while you're doing bug bounties is that you kind of realize how brain dead some of the bugs are at times. Like, there, it's really uh, discouraging when you see like really basic XSS that like OWASP's XSS page will teach you about show up on like major billion dollar company sites. Uh, and like when you find features that haven't gone through security reviews or you hope they haven't. Uh, so bug bounties are fun and I really think they're a good idea to like level yourself up because there's lots of cool things you can learn while you're doing them. Um, and if you find me after this talk, uh, I'll be more than happy to share some of my fun stories. But I kind of wanted to do something that felt a little bit more meaningful to me than just a couple of like write-ups every so often about this bug or that bug. Another thing I noticed while I was working in security was that occasionally there's this tendency for the security teams uh, and organizations on the whole to try to prioritize issues as they arose as opposed to kind of like proactively thinking about things. So I'm sure some of you who may have an on-call have been maybe empathizing with this. Uh, Pager duty going off all the time. You're waking up and you're like, oh, here's this other random thing that we have to go spend a bunch of engineering hours like fixing, getting cross collaboration with teams. Uh, and all the while, you may find yourself wondering, why are we doing this? Like, this is something that we knew about like a year ago. Why is it suddenly a priority? And I noticed that this kind of like reactive approach happened a lot. Uh, and, it, and it was something that I was, uh, you know, kind of viscerally against at times. So sometimes this is good, like sometimes you have to do this, right? Like the most recent example is Log4j. Like that was genuinely a pretty bad CVE, the first one that came out. Um, it's the kind of nasty thing you really want to go and like immediately fix, exploitable externally, all that fun stuff. So sometimes that makes sense, but I think some, this, sometimes this mentality gets abused. So let's talk a little bit about where vulnerabilities come from so we can maybe jump into the idea of more proactively solving issues. Unfortunately, there's lots of different ways that they can come, uh, like show up in your organization. Uh, so some examples here, like misconfigurations of services, like this Nginx 
uh, path traversal here, which uh, was caused by forgetting a trailing forward slash in the Nginx config. Sometimes it's just secrets that show up on people's GitHubs, whether it be the organizations or the employees' personal GitHub, uh, like the Shump Cloud API key from Starbucks. Or sometimes it's your infrastructure as a service being misconfigured, where you have like an EC2 instance that you took down and didn't realize you had a Route 53 record still pointed to that IP address for someone to snag the IP and then report it for a nice bounty, like this example with Uber. Well, my background is predominantly application security, and I love digging about in code. So from my perspective, where I wanted to look to try to address issues you know, proactively was in the type of, uh, like in the source code, where developers are going to be making mistakes, the kinds of things that you hope to catch in your secure code reviews, in your security design. Um, if you misuse a library, that's the kind of thing I want to talk about. If there's issues in the authorization model or it's not very cohesive, that's what I want to talk about. So let's, let's kind of like address what, why might developers introduce security issues? Like what is the root of that? Well, I don't think it's because programming itself is hard. Like there's so much resources out there to get people into it. Pretty much, you know, so many people are getting into the field now. It's the resources are super accessible, most often free. Um, I think the issue is actually an aspect of programming, especially at these organizations, collaboration and code composition. So Brian Cantrell, the CTO of Oxide Computer Company and the author of Dtrace, had this to say on composition. Even if you and I both know how to write memory safe C, it is very hard for us to have an interface boundary where we can agree who does what. He goes on to kind of give an example about handles, like perhaps a file handle or a handle to some sort of uh, resource, uh, pointers. Who frees that? When do I free that? In, in, error in, in, in error case, do I have to free this? Do you have to free this? And this is like, this is just like interacting with a particular library or a particular function. And without digging into the implementation, you don't know. It's not information exposed to you or enforced in any way. Have you ever thought about, have you ever thought to yourself, I'm so slow at shipping code at work, but then you go home and over a weekend with a bit of Red Bull, maybe some drinks, you crank out a side project that you get to show all your friends on Monday and it's like a thousand lines. It's, you went from nothing to shipped. You got a little badge for your, your build kite or circle CI on your GitHub and you go and show it off to everyone. You, you, ever, you ever think about that? that? That's part of that slowdown is that code composition problem. When you control the entire code base intimately and you have knowledge of how every single component works, it's really easy for you to op like work quickly, kind of have a cohesive model for how security should work in your system. Uh, and you don't have to deal with these assumptions or tribal knowledge that you need to build up when you, t when you build software at a large organization. Sometimes when you want to add a new feature, it involves you going to a bunch of teams, asking them for some context, trying to make sure that you align with their roadmap, and all this stuff really slows down an individual developer and adds a bunch of uncertainty into the mix. So how can code composition cause problems? Let's do a quick exercise. So this is a pretty simple Python class. We're, we're omitting you know, the implementation here. It's not important. Um, but on the screen is a class definition for some user class. And it has three methods, log in, do action, and log out. Now, if I asked you to explain to me how do I use this class, you might say, first, we'll instantiate the user object. We're going to provide some sort of username. Then we'll call login, after which we'll call do action some number of times, and then we'll call log out. And you'd probably be correct, right? This is like, this makes a lot of sense to us. But why does it make sense to you? Whoops. Oh, there we go. Why, why does it make sense to you? It, it makes sense to you because you have a lot of context on how this type of library or, or class is supposed to be used. You have seen login systems before. You have this internalized context on how this class works. Let's try it again. How does this one work? You have no idea. You look at the names here and none of it makes sense. This pattern is not recognizable to you. It, none, it doesn't invoke any ideas of how to use it. 
And for you to now know how to work with this class, you will have to either dig into the implementation or find some documentation that may explain what it's for, how to use it, assumptions it makes, and assumptions that you need to uphold when you interact with it for it to work safely. And that might seem like a ridiculous example, but think about how your developers feel when they work with crypto, uh, you know, cryptographic libraries. This is the uh, Python OpenSSL library. And to someone who's never heard of elliptic curves before, doesn't know what you know, uh, curve 25519 is, isn't aware of initialization vectors or any of this stuff, this is really, really scary. And even though there's documentation here, a lot of it is filled with heavy jargon that you can absolutely get lost in and throw your hands up in the air and just say, oh, this is frustrating. And you hope in those situations that those frustrated, confused developers are going to reach out to your security team. But you know what happens when they don't? You don't want to have this article written about your organization. Uh, this is a recent exploitation uh, or encryption flaw that showed up in a bunch of Samsung's products where they reused an initialization vector for AES-GCM. If you know what that means, that's really bad. That's kind of the cardinal sin of GCM mode. Uh, so this is really nasty. And this is the kind of thing that shows up when you have developers that have to make assumptions and uh, don't have a system that they can safely operate within. But this isn't limited to just cryptography or you know, esoteric security concepts. Any code that solves a problem that requires domain knowledge is subject to this issue. If you work at a bank, do you only hire developers that understand complex finance markets and concepts? If you work, or if you build uh, you know, medical devices or software, do your developers understand modern medicine or charting or in-office procedures? When I worked at that company in Northeast Ohio, we didn't. We kind of picked up on stuff over time, but when we sat down to build things, we just kind of like tried our best to follow a design doc. Do you think anyone understands Salesforce? We hire people to integrate with it regardless. And let me tell you, if you've never dug into the Salesforce documentation, you're lucky. So do you believe documentation will solve this problem? Well, here's the thing. Log4j was a big deal, but it was in the docs. If you actually just dug into Log4j's documentation, you would have seen JNDI lookup. You would have seen the environment lookups. And anyone who's done any sort of Java exploitation will be familiar with JNDI injection. So this is the kind of thing that should have caused some pause if your security team looked at the documentation. So if we can't be expected to look at the documentation, we can't really rely on our software engineers to do either. Our issues don't stop with just misusing libraries. Composition issues can occur across periods of time. So in this particular case, this is a library from Facebook. Uh, it's uh, one of their PHP libraries. I, I can't remember which. Uh, but this, this is where the here be dragons meme comes from, if you've ever seen that. Uh, this is a warning being given out that if you're changing this code, you're probably about to break some stuff. Uh, this happens all the time, where we have assumptions and ideas that were laid out in code by some old developer, may not even work there anymore, and then you are tasked with making changes. You're trying not to break anything intentionally, and you're not trying to adjust any unexpected behavior that's being depended on elsewhere in the system. An example of a vulnerability that may have been caused by this exact composition issue is skip TLS. So it's a bit hard to read, not really necessary, but the idea here is that this diagram lays out the TLS handshake state machine uh, that was used by JSSE's TLS implementation. Uh, the vulnerability here is that uh, you are allowed to actually skip states in the TLS handshake. Uh, and that allowed you to completely compromise the TLS connection. So if you had a man in the middle position, which is the whole point of TLS, uh, that you were able to maliciously like fast travel on the state machine here and completely get rid of authentication, any integrity, uh, all of uh, any cryptography that was being done here, all of it was just null and void. <laughs> 
a similar issue to skip TOS was a more recent libssh CVE. You may remember this from like 2018, 2019. Uh, this is a, a CVE 2018-10933. This vulnerability was an exploit against the shared state machine in libssh when you're performing the handshake. Instead of sending the expected user auth request message, which would begin the, the handshake authentication portion, your, uh, an attacker could just send user auth success and fast travel in well past the point where you have to do authentication uh, in the handshake here. And you know, just basically the libssh was completely useless at this point. Anyone could log in. Well, thankfully, we're gonna, we're, as we're about to see, type states are really, really good at addressing this type of problem, as well as giving context where documentation might fail us or tribal knowledge. So what are type states? Well, to understand type states, let's go over what a type is. At the end of the day, after your code is compiled or jitted down into assembly, uh, your program is not much more than some purposeful set of instructions that operate on bits and bytes. That's all it really is. Your CPU is not really aware of uh, what a string is. And nothing really stops us from programming this way either. Like we could sit down and write some x86 or MIPS and then build programs this way. And some people do this, but most of us don't. And the reason why is that it's much more difficult to make meaningful progress this way. It's less intuitive. You're much more error prone per unit of complexity in your program. So this is why we, you know, we've built these higher level languages. Your CPU isn't considering what a sequence of bytes is. It doesn't care if it's a sonnet or a picture of some sky uh, corresponding to an email, but people do. And so because we think about these bits and bytes this way, we built languages with type systems. Type systems define a set of rules and logic that we want to apply to types. And types are just labels we apply to variables and expressions uh, and, our, and functions in our code and this is going to influence the behaviors that we allow for those different variables and expressions. Uh, and, we do, and we enforce this by validating that code with a compiler, typically. So we either use a compiler, or sometimes it'll show up in runtime if you're using an interpreted language. But we use types to define what are the set, the complete set of operations that we allow this set of bytes to undertake and which with what other sets of bytes do we allow it? So to explain that a little bit further, in most languages, it's legal for us to add two integers together. That makes a lot of sense. And in most languages, we typically are allowed to add two strings together. But in some languages, it's not OK to add a string and an integer together. But in others, it's OK. So th that's kind of where that type system thing differentiates. In some languages, we're allowed to mix types, and in others, we're not. Uh, and so that, that, that's what like, defines each of these type systems for various languages. So at a high level, types allow us to reduce the number of legal programs down to those that only perform operations in a way that has been defined by our type system. So why are types important? Well, aside from stopping programs that almost certainly contain a mistake, they're an awesome feedback loop for developers. Uh, and, and I feel like I need to say this because I do hear uh, occasionally when I talk to people about their passion for languages like JavaScript and Python that don't have as strict a type system. And so I kind of want to cover this to really sell the idea of why a stronger type system like a language like Golang or, or Java or, or you know, anything like that, C Sharp, uh, kind of brings and why that's actually beneficial. So aside from stopping, yeah, so uh, if you're using a compiled language like Golang or C Sharp, then your developers can immediately identify programs that will likely do something wrong before they reach production. And it's much more expensive to fix issues once they've reached production. Uh, so imagine an if statement with a condition that's only going to fire once a year, maybe some sort of like end of the year report. If you contain a mistake in there, something simple like you know, adding a string to some object that you hadn't actually built a string representation for yet, and you don't know about that until that end of the year report has to happen, that is going to suck to debug then. You definitely want to debug it as you're writing it, as opposed to like a year down the line. So types allow us to test and validate some behavior, uh, regardless of branching, regardless of how infrequent that condition fires, 
um, just ahead of time. And speaking of tests, what about tests? There's even a development philosophy focused around tests. Uh, well, that doesn't show up well, but TDD, uh, Test Driven Development. We often use tests to validate behavior for programs before we ship them pr pr to production. It's probably a part of your CI CD pipeline now. Um, but it's not really the end all be all solution here. First of all, our tests can get out of sync with our program as it changes. In many cases, uh, if you are adding behavior to the program or augmenting it, you may need to change existing tests or add tests. And your tests may not cover everything that you need. OK, so anyway, back to type states. We've covered what type systems are. We've talked about types. We kind of talked a little bit about why tests aren't really like the end all be all solution to validating program behavior. Uh, what is a type state? What does this talk about? Well, it depends a little bit. Type states were originally defined as a refinement on the idea of types. The key differentiation is this. Types define the set of all operations permitted on an object. For strings, that may be things like concatenating them together. Uh, perhaps if you have a string builder, you can add things on. Arrays, you can index into them. You can probably push onto a list or a vector. These are the operations that are permitted on this object. Type states determine which of those operations are allowed in that object's state. For example, an array may have an add and remove function, or we'll say list or vector. And as that list or vector is empty, I can add elements on. And I can also remove them. But what if that list is empty? Type states would allow me to express the idea that I should not be allowed to call remove ahead of time. And the compiler can enforce this. So a common example, though, that's used when we discuss type states is a file. So here we have kind of the Python definition for, uh, you know, Python class that we've kind of redefined files for a simpler API. Uh, in this case, we'll just, you know, initialize it with some sort of path. We can open, file, read from it, and close it. But what are some potential issues with this? Uh, right now, nothing would stop me from creating this file object and just calling read on it immediately. But we can, you know, using some of that intuition and experience that we have, assume that we probably need to call open file first. So now we already have this problem where this API allows me to do things incorrectly, and we can't really assume that people are going to always do the correct thing when they work with this library. So we have that, like, like that user class example before, we're kind of just like hoping our developers know the right way to use this. However, with proper type states, we're actually forced to work with the file type in a particular way. A type state system performs type state analysis on your program ahead of time and will ensure that you've actually interacted with this class in the correct way. For example, if we had instantiated a file but never opened it, we would never be able to call read in the first place because we weren't in a state where read was accessible to us. Likewise, if we called close file at some point, we would similarly not be able to read it anymore because we'd be back into the initialized state. This is the original idea behind type states. And unfortunately, the idea as a language feature hasn't really caught on. I'm sure you probably have never heard of type states before and is certainly not in the languages you might be using. Well, Rust actually had this as a feature back in its early days. It was actually baked into the language, but they removed it back in Rust 0.4, and it's way far from that at this point. As it was infrequently used and necessarily complex uh, in the compiler and had very long passes, so the notoriously long compilation step was quite longer. So if type states were removed from Rust and we haven't really seen them in other mainstream languages, what's the point of this talk? Well, these days type states have a slightly different meaning. These days, type states refer to a design pattern that emulates the benefits of the original type state idea. You've probably already used the type state pattern and you didn't even know it. Have you ever heard of the builder pattern? The builder pattern is a type state. Look at this. This is the process builder that's in Java. 
we see that we start in some uninitialized state. We create a new process builder, which the constructor requires that we pass in a valid process name. Then from there, we can call environments or directory and a whole host of other methods on it. And this allows us to set things up for our process ahead of time. We'll set the environment variables we want, the directory we'll be running in. And then we can call start. Start gives us back a process object. This is a state transition into a brand new state, a new type state. If we did not have a process builder in, our, in place, and I know I said Python and Rust, but here's some Java, all right? Uh, if we didn't have a process builder in our place, our API would suggest that we could call start and then set environment variables, or call start and then maybe change the directory that this process is running from. And that doesn't make as much sense to us, or at least maybe some of us who have worked with this type of API before, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but someone who hasn't, they may not know any better. This seems to suggest that you could do that. So type states can be constructed in a number of different ways. And one popular way is through distinct types, like we've seen with process builder and process, two distinct classes that we defined in our code. And we define state transitions with these methods. Another way, uh, a little bit more complex, and we're not going to go into this all too much here, but another way is through generics. So if you've worked with a language with generics before, uh, like Java or C Sharp or most recently Golang, um, you, this may seem a little familiar of an idea, but we can have a process class and define a state like not started and started, where in not started, we're allowed to call the methods like environment and directory and then start. And then when we're in the started state, we no longer have access to those methods, but we can terminate the process. OK, so so far we've kind of looked at examples where type states can be used to solve relatively innocuous bugs, uh, things that are probably going to cause exceptions in your code at some point, but not really you know, get, keep the security team up at night. So how can we solve some security problems with them? OK, so here we have two classes defined in Python. The first is a user class, and the second is an authenticated user class. Our goal here is to ensure that developers can only call do action, if you remember that example from earlier, uh, after they've properly logged in. Additionally, if the developer logs out of the account, we don't want them, we don't allow them to call the do action function again. So this is kind of like the simpler explanation of that, uh, we want developers to basically follow this flowchart. So we start at user. We always require a transition to login before they can call do action. And then at some point, if they call log out, they should no longer be able to do that. Unfortunately, this is where Python and most other languages tend to break down with this idea. There's actually nothing in the language that is semantically preventing us from calling do action after we call log out. In this case, I can create a user object. I can log myself in, and that will return to me the authenticated user. Authenticated user can call do action. Uh, then I can call log out. And in an ideal world with type states, I would be unable to you know, call do action. But unfortunately, Python allows me to continue to call that object. Like, of course, we can enforce in code with, say, a Boolean that tracks the internal state of if I'm logged in or not, or some sort of session, that when we call do action, it should fail. But we don't get any sort of feedback at, say, a compiler level or type checking level that this is not allowed. So we can kind of see the problem a little bit more clearly if we follow this flow diagram. The bottom left is where we're going to start with that user. We call login. And now we have two objects that still exist and are accessible to us as a developer. We have the authenticated user and that user object. So we call do action. We continue on as an authenticated user here. And we call log out. And that will return a different user object that we could then use uh, for whatever our next step may be. The problem is that after we call log out, the authenticated user object still persists. Because of this, we can call do action, which is not our intent. Well, this is true for most languages. Remember when we discussed type systems before? Rust has a very distinct type system from most other languages you may be familiar with. 
With most normal languages like Python, Java, C Sharp, uh, they use what's called normal types. And normal types have that property we saw in the previous uh, flow, uh, flow chart. And the, 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 where, when we create that variable, we're allowed to, we, we can interact with that variable again. Um, in Rust, it has a slightly different type system called an affine type system. And this has a very distinct meaning. It means that we're actually able to benefit from both the moving into the authenticated user state as well as moving away. We can actually expire variables uh, in these state transitions. In Rust, this operation is called a move. Um, and I'm not going to go too much into the details here, but we'll explain this visually. Okay, so this is hopefully pretty similar to the Python code, or uh, at least hopefully accessible. Uh, we have two structs, which you can think of as kind of like classes, a user and an authenticated user struct. The user struct has a login function that allows us to go from the user object to authenticated user. And then an authenticated user has two methods, a do action, which is what we expect, and then a logout function, which tells us that it will return a user object. But keep, uh, keep a close look at where self shows up. Very similar to Python, we have a self uh, in Rust. In the login function, we have a self without an ampersand. and do action, we have a self with an ampersand. And then log out, we have one without an ampersand. That allows us to do this. Um, I have taken the liberty here to make translucent the, uh, the circles that are, are the uh, objects that are no longer accessible to us. Because of that ampersand being present or not, we can actually, we can tell Rust whether or not objects should be accessible after that method has been called. So from user, we can call login, and that user object can no longer be touched. It becomes a compiler error if you interact with that object again. So we call login, and we state transition into an authenticated user, call do action, and we notice that ampersand was present, so this isn't going to get rid of our object. We can continue to call that function as much as we want. Then we can call log out and get a state transition back into a different user. We are actually building this state machine and getting the, the enforcement benefits from the compiler. This is the power of type states in a language like Rust over other languages. So type states are still useful in these other languages, but this gives us much more enforcement capability. Uh, so we can see with our improper usage of user and authenticated user here, where we are basically doing the same thing that we did in that Python example before. We created a user object called login, do action, log out. By calling do action again, which was permissible in Python, we get a compiler error that tells us this is illegal. And this is because that log out method makes the auth user no longer accessible to us. So that's like a relatively simple, like security style problem that we could potentially solve. But what's something a little bit harder and more interesting, maybe a little bit more applicable? Authorization models are infrequently described in you know, sufficient detail to determine whether or not you need to perform certain checks ahead of time, uh, like what properties do you need to test. If you're writing a method that allows your users to fetch the contents of a document, how do you know what tests you need to perform ahead of time? Do you have a sharing model? Are you aware of that? Perhaps another team has been working on that and you weren't aware in the first place. While you're working on this asynchronously, you could be implementing a method that is eventually going to result in a security vulnerability where there's an access control problem. It's pretty normal for your developers to have to reach out to other teams, dig in through implementation and maybe old Slack messages from like three years ago, if your retention policy permits, to try to understand how a particular feature or resources in your program works. So things get a little bit more complex if your feature is a composite of a bunch of existing primitives. So perhaps you are a, you know, you're building a bank and you want to build, you know, 
money sending features or investment features, and you're going to be interacting with a bunch of different things on like testing the risk profile and seeing if users have enough money available and like withdrawing money from accounts and moving it around. And these are functions that probably already exist, but you're building it into a brand new product that you want to present. This makes authorization really complicated. You have a lot of interactions that may not have existed before, and trying to figure that out from just context and you know, communicating with people can be difficult and a very long and tedious process. For our example, we will be building a bank. Uh, and, our, and our new feature for this bank, we're going to be uh, building like a send money feature, something you might expect uh, you know, PayPal to have or Venmo. So we're going to try to use a, uh, an access control model called ABAC, or uh, attribute-based access control. Uh, where, where what you do is you'll test properties about your subject and resources ahead of time and just determine if you are allowed to take an action based on those properties. And this is actually probably true for the software that you manage as well. Um, it's probably an ABAC system. Uh, RBAC is like relatively restrictive. So uh, one example of the attributes that we may want to be testing is whether or not accounts are enabled or not. So perhaps you know, bank detects some fraudulent activity. They want to disable the account to kind of protect themselves and do some investigation. This is a attribute that we will want to test ahead of time. Another type of attribute you might see in software is, is this request coming from a VPN IP? If you do any sort of like IP whitelisting, um, this is the type of attribute you might be testing yourself. So our first step uh, into building a type state that could help us here is we're going to create a, uh, a type called check. And its job is to hold three bits of information. What check did you perform? We'll call that the test. So this is typically going to be the conditional that you will use in those uh, authorization checks or attribute checks. This is going to ask the question, am I on the VPN IP? Is this account enabled? Do we have enough funds in the account? Things like that. Uh, the subject is going to be the resource that you're performing that test against. So that might be a particular, or that might be like a user account or a request object to check the IP. And then we'll have this next. And this will allow us to nest these checks together into one gigantic kind of ugly type. So. This is a little bit uh, complicated here, but in this, uh, we have two tests here. And I just want to highlight something um, that Rust will allow us to do that we're not going to get into to try to save you all the boring details of it. But in the first test versus the second test, we actually have the checks we're applying in reverse order. So in the first one, we test if the account un is enabled, then the VPN IP. In the second, we say VPN IP, then account enabled. Uh, just just want to give you context without going into the, the details here. In Rust, we can actually make both of these types treated the same by the compiler. So we, we can make them both uh, kind of a you know, unified type. And we can kind of see that here. We have a method at the bottom called requires both. And requires both says that you need to have the has account enabled trait and has VPN IP trait. And it doesn't matter the order. So this is just a concept I want to convey without getting into the nitty gritty type system details on how that is done. But in this case, be, even though we're nesting them in different orders, as long as it's present in that chain, that test is something we can, we can talk about on the type level. So this kind of already sounds like a lot of messy details that you have to like implement these really long, like thousand character long types. And it sounds awful that no one would want to do this. And it almost, sound, almost sounds like a research project. So I built a like researchy type project library called Daiquiri. Uh, what this, and it does all this nasty work for you. So if you were looking at this and like basically falling asleep and you're like, oh, this is awful, I don't blame you. It's awful to work with having to write those types out manually. Daiquiri does it for you. And it gives you a really easy to understand and write policy language that will then generate these types and then make, your, make the compiler your best friend. It will tell you when you're forgetting to do authorization checks ahead of time. So here's an example of what those policies might look like. Ahead of time, we kind of declare a couple of elements that we're, we want to do tests against, or relationships that we want to check, 
So we have an account with an account ID. We have a handle to a bank. This, we, we can assume this is some sort of way to talk to a database. And we have a constraint. We just want to know if this account has been frozen or not. So as we ask that for an active account policy to be applied, the account is not frozen for that particular bank. So once you have satisfied this policy, the deposit method is now available to you. And this is actually enforced at compile time. You cannot call deposit unless a, a test, a successful test, has been performed that validates the account has not been frozen. There is no need to ask people on a particular team that manages this function or this service, what tests do I need to do? They are right there in the code, and the compiler will be your best friend. No need to reach out over Slack or send a JIRA ticket in. It's all done at the time you're writing code. Similarly, we implement a withdrawal method. We're going to add an additional uh, constraint here. Notice that we are uh, we're reusing the previous policy, which was active account policy. We are kind of basing this one off of that. And we're saying, in addition to testing that the account is not frozen, you should also make sure that the account is authenticated, that your current session, when you make this request, corresponds to this account. If anyone could just withdraw money, that'd be pretty bad bank. But in this case, because I am adding this condition, the compiler will enforce that we've validated that our current session corresponds to this account. And as long as we've done that, we can call withdraw. So it's kind of a little bit of nasty, nasty bit of code here, but when we want to test attributes, we'll use these constraint functions. We basically will just say, oh, I'd like to make sure that the account is not frozen, or I'd like to make sure that our account is authenticated with this session. Uh, in the example with the receiver here, all we have to do is just make sure that the account is not frozen. And now we're allowed to call the send money handler method. And it's pretty, uh, it's pretty easy to read, I think. Uh, send money handler takes a sender and receiver for you know, some sort of like send money feature. An authenticated account policy is required of the sender. This will enforce that you have uh, all, you've done all the appropriate checks required to prove that you are allowed to withdraw money. And then for the receiver, they just have to have an active account. You don't have to be logged in as them or anything like that. Uh, and there's one important distinction here, though. We're not just adding these types to the, be like, hey, please do this at some point. And somebody else could come along and be like, I'm going to make send in, you know, insecure send money handler that doesn't use these types. These, these are not there by the developer's choice. The compiler required these to be there. If you were to try to define this function, Oops, not that one. If you're trying to define this function, which inevitably takes money out of the sender's account, sends it to the receiver, uh, and you didn't have those types there, the compiler would return an error. It said those pol the policies to access the withdrawal function, the policies to access the deposit function, required tests to be performed ahead of time. And these types are just useful to the developer to know what those are. But we could actually add all sorts of other different types there as well. Some of them will allow the call to go forward, but the compiler is requiring that those types are there. Uh, uh, yeah, we covered this already. Talked about how that policy was inside. Uh, but one interesting thing is that uh, the, about the value of using types for this type of problem is that because we've defined the authenticated account policy, the one that allows us to withdraw money, as a superset of the constraints for the one that allows us to deposit money, even though the authenticated account policy doesn't define a deposit function, it's there. This, anything that abides by this policy inherits all the functionality that the lesser policy has. Even if we didn't explicitly put that active account policy as a constraint, and all we did was just say the account is not frozen here in the list of constraints, that is implicitly there. The compiler will allow that to go forward. So this approach might seem maybe a bit out there, uh, you know, but there are similar ideas already in the wild. We see this mostly, obviously, with Rust, because Rust allows us to do a lot of these crazy ideas. But in fact, the type state pattern in general shows up in a ton of software. So let's look uh, at a few of them today. <clears throat> 
So the uh, first one that I want to cover is called Anchor. It's a library in Rust that's uh, commonly used with like Solana smart contracts. So you know whether or not crypto is your thing, um, it's a pretty useful and interesting library. Uh, the, the, it's actually very similar to Daiquiri in that they use types to kind of elevate authorization tests into the type system, but to a much lesser and probably more approachable degree. So for example, they have this account type, this signer type, program type, uh, system type, and all of these actually have different important meanings in the Solana ecosystem. Uh, signer, for example, will only succeed to deserialize. This is for uh, serializing from basically raw bytes. But signer will only succeed if that account signed the transaction. It's an important thing in the Solana ecosystem, uh, and it's part of what makes it secure or not uh, in implementation. Uh, additionally, program is also important. It makes sure that attackers can't pass in their own programs for cross-program invocation. So it does important checks, and these checks are codified in the type system. Furthermore, these types actually gate functionality as well. So these will actually only allow you to call certain methods if that type is there. And that, that type being there means that those tests were performed at deserialization time. Another common one, uh, pretty big in the Rust space, is called Serde. Uh, less security focused here, but it's just another interesting usage of type states to describe state machines. So Serde uses a bunch of methods on its core serializer trait. This is kind of like the bread and butter, the heart of this library. It uses these types, these methods here, serialize map, serialize struct, serialize tuple, to transition in the state machine into brand new types. And this allows it to enforce that you don't take an object and serialize it multiple different ways. So it, it can only go through one, uh, one step of uh, deserialization or serialization at a time. So as I said, it doesn't have like a huge effect on security. Uh, it could, but in this case, it's mostly for developer happiness. But a popular library that does benefit from type states is curl. Uh, curl is really modular in that you can kind of change the back end of it a bit. And uh, curl supports Rust LS or Russells or whatever. It's Rust's implementation or a Rust implementation of TLS. So uh, Russells um, uses type states to build a state machine for TLS. And so this gives you an incredibly high degree of confidence that you're never going to have a skip TLS vulnerability. Because all of those state transitions are hard coded into, uh, into the code in an ergonomic way that makes it really hard for someone to do wrong. Like a developer who's never worked on this project can get in there and probably not break things and introduce a huge vulnerability, like skipping all of the key exchange in a TLS handshake. There is some other projects as well, like Arty, which is a, uh, a brand new Tor client that the Tor project has been working on uh, that's using uh, type states as well to kind of handle a lot of handshake work as well. Uh, and then there's this other project, Bulletproof, which is an incredibly fast zero knowledge proof, um, uh, proof library. It's, it uses uh, something called session types, very similar to type states. Um, the distinction here is that it's for a, uh, a state machine that's shared across kind of like an asynchronous context. It's not really that important, but it's the kind of thing that showed up when we were looking at the JSSE, JSSE's TLS client implementation. This is uh, helping them ensure that state transitions are always the exact ones that they're expecting and that there's no skipping around of states. It also means that when you sit down and you want to contribute to these projects, you don't need to have a bunch of knowledge ahead of time about what certain libraries are for, what's the authorization model that's being used. The types are enforcing that for you. The compiler is the one that's going to help you. So here's the key takeaways, okay? Type states are, a, the type state pattern is a way for us to determine which actions in a given context are legal. And that this pattern is useful 
in a, as a way to define the legal or safe usages of your API. So don't just rely on a single type that's really huge that has all the different methods on it. Live a little. Add some types to your code. Make those types restrict what actions are allowed given on the state. Secondly, using this pattern in Rust, if you haven't tried Rust yet, is actually a really ergonomic way to define real state machines in your code. If you ever felt like, wow, I could really use a state machine here, this is actually kind of complicated state transitions, maybe try Rust. It could be a useful way to express those ideas. And lastly, code composition is a hard problem. But using type states can help us eliminate those assumptions uh, that end up introducing vulnerabilities uh, in, in your program. Thanks. Any questions? No? Oh, yeah. That's a great question. Absolutely. Imagine that you are like a lender and you're trying to handle loans. Your loans are going to go through a bunch of states as well. This is a great way to define the state transitions so people can't just kind of skip review processes or, or jump right into the loan has been paid off state. Uh, so yeah, this is a fantastic way to kind of express those and ensure that you don't get you know, screwed out of your money if you're a lender. But this is probably true for a bunch of different business processes as well. A lot of software allows you to define document workflows or you know, ticket workflows like Jira, for example, um, this might be a good way to, def you know, to express those. Maybe not as security critical or important to the survivability of the business in those cases, but at minimum it'll make it easier for your developers to work with. Yeah. Uh, do you know of any libraries off the top of your head that do this well in other languages? Just as, as kind of a bolt on. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I think. Off the top of my head, there's probably, there's probably libraries that are doing this like state transition-y stuff, um, but they're probably not doing it thinking, we're using type states right now. Uh, like I mentioned, Java uses the builder pattern a ton. So if you're using builders and factories and all that stuff, you're probably falling into a type state pattern. Um, but yeah, none come to mind as like really good examples in other languages. But there probably are. That's, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all.